I'm John Donaghy from the Catholic Student Center. One of the groups that is, that is co-sponsoring this, this co uh, conference on 40 years after Hiroshima, Lessons for the Future. We're glad to have this number of people out for this second of, of our six presentations during these, these two days on 40 years after Hiroshima. This one o'clock, uh, Peter Wyden spoke on scientists shaping history, giving an explanation of the Manhattan Project and some of its consequences for today. This evening, Dr. Franklin Wong, who has been involved in, the, assisted in the talks resulting in the limited test ban treaty, will be speaking in Curtis Hall, uh, in Curtis Auditorium, on advancing technology barriers to arms control. Tomorrow, three of the, event, the events, all of them in the South Ballroom, which is right behind you. At noon, Dr. Kerr doc, from the Los Alamos National Laboratory will speak on the role of armaments in the nuclear age. At four o'clock, Alan Geyer, a religious ethicist, will speak on nuclear ethics and human destiny. And in the evening, there will be a panel of Alan Geyer, Don Kerr, and Dr. Long on our nuclear future. That should be quite an exciting event with James Gannon from the Register moderating. I'm going to thank you all for coming. We also want to thank all those, those groups who were involved in this, the, this process, uh, including the Committee on Lectures, the Stanley Foundation, the Religious Studies Program, the United Ministries in Higher Education, Campus Ministers Association, the Physics Department, and Ames Lab. I would like to introduce for this section uh, Ames and the Manhattan Project Reflections. Uh, Dick Van Eyten from the Department of Philosophy, who will introduce uh, and will moderate the panel. Dick. Thanks very much. It's nice to see everybody here. Our procedure this afternoon will be to give each member of the panel, well, we, we really don't have much choice. They insist upon it. Each, each of these distinguished gentlemen will have an opportunity, 10 to 12 minutes, to make an individual autobiographical <coughs> statement about their past involvement with the Manhattan Project. In that statement, there will be a number of reflective comments made, which we hope to develop further in the discussion that will follow the third presentation by the uh, junior member of our panel, Dave Peterson, on my far left. Let me introduce, there, so there should be plenty of uh, opportunity for discussion in the format that we have. We don't have uh, to end our discussion until around 5 o'clock. The first speaker this afternoon is Professor Adolf Voigt, who's been at Iowa State for a number of years. He's a Californian, born there in way back when. He has a very lovely wife who's here this afternoon that I know very well. They're one of those elegant faculty teams that all universities thrive on having about. Adolf did his undergraduate work at Pomona and did his MA at Claremont and then eventually went on to the University of Michigan where he took his PhD in 1941. After a brief teaching stint at Smith College, he became associated in 1942 with the Manhattan Project here at Iowa State, which was then Iowa State College. Over the years, he's held a number of important positions in association with the university and the Ames Lab as a director and as a scientist, and he currently holds the status of Professor Emeritus of Chemistry uh, since 1982. As you can imagine, he and his colleagues have all kinds of awards and distinctions in their professional histories. Uh, they are first-class scientists and first-class citizens of the university community. Uh, after everything is over, you will have an opportunity, I think, to see a, a, an interesting interplay of three personalities, scientists coming in the same general context, having what I found to be yesterday in discussing things with them rather interesting and differing kinds of perspectives on things. Our second speaker will be um, Norm Carlson, who's on my immediate left. Norm came to, well, Norm is from South Dakota. He did his undergraduate work at Yankton. He came to Iowa State University and finished a PhD in 1950. Like Adolf, he has a number of distinctions and honors in his professional history. He's been associated with the university in a variety of capacities and worked in a number of different ways. I think, let's see, yes, in 1960, uh, he became a professor of metallurgy and he, a senior metallurgist with the uh, Ames Lab. And uh, he's currently very active in his research. He's also had a number of uh, prominent students. Our, our 
Third speaker will be Dave Peterson, the junior member of our panel. Uh, Dave is from an interesting place in Minnesota, Blue Earth, Minnesota. It's a nice little town. Um, he's married to Joanne Cole Peterson, very nice person. He came to Iowa State in 1941 and following full-time research uh, work on the Adam Baum project, he eventually completed his bachelor's degree in 1947 and finished a PhD in chemistry in 1950. As is true of his colleagues, he has a number of distinctions and awards to his credit. He's currently an active researcher and is at the present time a senior metallurgist and professor associated with the Ames lab. As I said earlier, each member of the panel will make a sort of an autobiographical statement describing their involvement with the Manhattan Project, and then we'll have an opportunity following those individual statements to engage in a discussion with all three. Adolf, why don't you go ahead? Before I begin anything autobiographical, I would like to talk a little bit about the history of the science behind the atomic bomb in the years preceding the Hiroshima and preceding the Manhattan Project itself. Uh, this science was very largely a European science, starting with the discovery of radioactivity in 1895 by Henri Becquerel, a Frenchman. Some of the greatest advances in the in this, uh, field, in the subject, were made almost directly after that by Marie Sklodowska Curie and her husband, Pierre Curie. She was a Polish chemist working in Paris. Her husband was a, a French physicist. And together they uh, did a tremendous body of work in separating out the various materials which are found with uranium and which are highly radioactive. Uh, at about that same time, a New Zealander named Ernest Rutherford started doing similar work. He was particularly responsible for determining what the radiations were, the alpha, beta, and gamma rays, which come off from the radioactive material. He did this work in Canada and in, and in England. He also identified some of the other radioactive elements. You are also all aware of the fact that the science of getting energy out of mass depends upon a particular equation stated first by Albert Einstein in 1905. Of course, Albert Einstein was a German physicist, and he proposed the equivalence of mass and energy at that time and showed that a very small amount of mass gives rise to a very large amount of energy. 1912, Ernest Rutherford was again very productive and demonstrated that the atom has a small heavy nucleus, uh, about one ten thousandth the radius of the atom itself. And Niels Bohr, a Danish physicist, showed how structure, such a structure can exist. And we still make use of the Rutherford Bohr picture of the atom. Uh, in 1911 and 12, uh, Frederick Soddy, who was English, and Casimir Fian, a nuclear chain reaction was, was possible. Uh, it was also found that the rare form of uranium, uranium-235, was the one responsible for fission by slow neutrons, and that the products of this fission were highly radioactive. The rest of the period then from 1939 to 1941 was the period in which the U.S. was becoming more and more involved through a, a letter written by Einstein to Franklin Roosevelt that led him in 1939 to get a program started in the field and that then uh, kept on until 1941 when the experiments were done which, which showed that things were going to be feasible to go ahead with the, with the projects that were done at the time. A tremendous thing was, uh, was fairly clear, but uh, the impetus to getting together and working on it in view of the fact that this science, so much of this science had been, previous science had been done in Germany, the impetus to getting at it and, and seeing to it that, that we, if Hitler and his even the scientists in Germany produced this and, and turned it over to the Third Reich, that that uh, was balanced by our also being able to, to uh, counteract that. This was a tremendous uh, impetus toward doing things, even though they 
were not uh, exactly in all this diversity of opinions, I do not recall any discussions uh, regarding the, the feasibility or the importance of what we were doing. There seemed to be a unanimity of opinion that what we were doing was right, that, uh, that the thing would, would and should be used. And I, I remember, I, 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 in, in the circles I ran in at least, there were very, there were just no discussions of whether we should or shouldn't and so on, such as apparently it happened in Chicago and Los, Mal and Los Alamos and other places. I don't know what that says about us, but it, I guess it says something. My reactions in August 6th were one of elation, I must say. Um, and uh, at the end of the war, it turned to jubilation when the Japanese surrendered, um, as was the mood of the nation at that time. I think we felt like heroes. Uh, maybe that may seem strange today, but I think at the time we did feel like we had performed a very important and valuable uh, uh, mission for our country. The analysis, I think you understand this, you have to understand the mood, the national mood. Uh, there was a, a war weariness. People wanted to get the thing over with and get back to normal, get back to school back to driving cars and all that stuff. You know, that was the mood of the country as a whole. And uh, it's the same, I think, you see in, in any war, in any bitter war that lasts. The same mood that happened uh, after the Civil War. People, life, property becomes secondary to getting the thing out of the way, getting it over with. We saw it in, this, in, the, in, in the World War I, and I think the Vietnam War shows that, shows us uh, what happens when you on a long war goes too long. People get weary and they begin to think life is cheap. We were inured, I think, to death and destruction. It had become some. We had seen um, death camps and death marches. And we'd uh, seen flamethrowers and kamikaze attacks, and terror raids, and firestorms. We read about the firestorm in, in Dresden that killed over 50,000 people just from a single bombing raid, 80,000 people on one mass air raid in, in Japan. And seemingly, these kind of massive things apparently had little to do with even shortening the, the war by one day, looking back on it. And at least the, uh, the bomb did stop the killing. And I think that was sort of the, the mood at the time. Um, I suppose you might say uh, um, the feeling that the war that started with surprise at Pearl Harbor, it was only natural that it should end with a surprise at Hiroshima. I think uh, looking back over the 40 years, uh, I would say it would diff be difficult even today for me to second guess President Truman on uh, the decision to use the, the bomb to end the war. Um, <clears throat> president Truman, in my view, was a very human and humane president, perhaps the most <coughs> human, humane president we've had, in my opinion, in the years that I've been on this earth. So I, I have respect for the man and, and the decisions. Um, I think that the, uh, some people have felt he should be branded as a war criminal. I would have to say that it would have been a greater act of criminality had he chosen to uh, sacrifice thousands, maybe hundreds of thousands of lives in an in attack in, on Japan and, and not have used the, the bomb to end it. Uh, in the words of, of Churchill, it, uh, I think it would sum up the view of many of people who were waiting, Marines, soldiers who were waiting for that invasion, and I've talked to many people, and so have you, who were in that, who have been on that, those first waves of the, the attack that was to come later that fall, that it was a miracle of deliverance. Uh, and even, I think, even though they may not have realized at the time, it was a miracle of deliverance for the, the Japanese soldiers and flyers and, and many of the, most of the Japanese civilians. Um, 
of course, for the people of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, it was not a miracle deliverance, it was a holocaust. My, uh, in the interval of 40, 40 years, I suppose if there's anything that's changed in my view, it is a greater skepticism about the infallibility of national leaders and, and uh, Mr. Wyden, I think, reflected on some of my views on that point as well. We've seen it, I think, uh, we've grown skeptical about the national leadership, not only from this incident, but from Vietnam and Watergate and in Iran and Lebanon, Lebanon and even in Central America. We perhaps don't believe our leaders, what they tell us, as much as we did back in my generation when I, when I was younger. I think living in Germany has given me a, a little uh, different insight. I, it's, it's kind of strange to sit and talk to friends and, and, and have them describe the bombing that took place uh, on a certain day in Stuttgart, in the very house in the very community we're sitting in. We were living in at the time and hear their reaction to the, the bombing in a very dispassionate sort of conversation you know, uh, and, and to engage in conversation with people who were on the other side and who were supposedly you know, those bad guys, and when you get to know them, they're, they're good guys, they're good people. I mean, they're people you, you learn to love. And that has given me a new insight. I think it was um, the uh, opportunity I had a couple summers ago to visit the uh, nuclear test facility there in the little town, Swedish town of Hyderlof, where the uh, Germans were, had conducted their uh, first test reactor. They had uh, little cubes of uranium about two inches on the side. I think there were 300 of these cubes hanging on chains down in a tank, and then the tank was filled with heavy water. My German companion says there is the world's first chain reactor. <laughs> <laughs> um, the, they were, as Peter Wyden said, they were, they had gotten nowhere. They weren't even where we were in the sports courts of Chicago in 1941. And in fact, as he said, they were not even working on the bomb. They were do, trying to develop a, a reactor, which later was the one that was built at Karlsruhe based on much the same model. Uh, thinking about Hiroshima and Nagasaki, I, um, this one does give me pause. I guess the question I, I have to ask is, what was the hurry? Uh, the, the Japanese, clearly were no offensive threat to us any longer. Um, their Navy and their Air Force was pretty impotent and we knew that. They were not in danger, they weren't even working on an atom bomb that we were concerned about or rockets. The only thing they had, and they had plenty of this, was a spirit to hold out and fight and, and their soldiers and, their, and, their, and uh, their flyers were, you know, were very, still very, determined pull, and uh, I don't know whether I agree they were quite ready to quit or not, but I guess the question is whether whether, whether there's such a hurry in, in launching the attack that we could not have considered and should not have considered perhaps uh, uh, the, the demonstration approach. Um, or if, if why pick, if you, want, if you don't want just a pure demonstration, why pick a town of 100,000, a town of 10,000, or a community of 10,000 would have probably made the same point. After all, we didn't bomb Japan, which would have probably taken 500,000 people out in a single blast. So I think that that one was, is one point in which I would, I would question the, the wisdom of, of our leaders. But I think that, um, and I think, I feel that the second bomb in Nagasaki uh, was unconscionable. Um, it it only happened only two days after the first one. The Russians had declared war that same afternoon, and it does seem that uh, a little time to find a reaction and get the impact of all this might have saved at least the second bomb. But then there is the old adage in war, you know, when you're and Grant believed in this, you know, when you have them down, stomp on them, or Sherman says, you know, press them. And I guess that's the mood of the military. When you have somebody on the run, you, 
and use everything we had to bring it to a conclusion. Um, I'd like to close on, on a note of hope. I've spent my entire professional career uh, in the field of atomic energy, and I'd hate to think that was purely a waste. And in fact, I don't, uh, I, I believe that uh, the Lord God, when he uh, looked at his creation and said that it was good, uh, included nuclear energy in that good. And uh, I believe that the time will come when we will see that nuclear energy is uh, a blessing, can be a blessing to, to mankind. Unfortunately, our dreams for peaceful uses have kind of waxed and waned in the last 40 years, and the uh, nuclear or the military uh, destructive elements have kind of taken ascendancy. But I'm hopeful that someday, we will, before it's too late, we will come to our senses, the leaders of the nations. Why I believe so? Because we have to. Uh, and once we have the we have that off of our backs, people will begin to see that uh, uh, nuclear power can be safe and clean, and in a true, clean and safe alternative to fossil fuels, which I feel are one of the real dangers to our um, plant and animal life in the Northern Hemisphere today. Thank you very much, Norm. Let's turn now to Dave. Dave? Before I can uh, get very involved in telling about how I became interested and uh, participating in the project here at Ames, I thought I'd spend just a little time telling why, a little bit of background about why there was a project here at Ames. And tracing this back, basically there was a project here at Ames because Dr. F.H. Spetty was here at Ames. So we have to go back a step further and ask, well, now, why was Dr. F.H. Spedding here at Ames? He was born in Michigan. He was trained in California. And uh, to go from Michigan to California and back to uh, this part of the Midwest is not a usual route. Even back then, it wasn't. Uh, Spedding was here because he had joined the Iowa State staff in 1937. The only reason that he was able to do that is because Dr. Hayes had left rather precipitously to take an industrial job with uh, Armco Steel. And uh, Spedding was available. He was a very well-established scientist. But due to something which we haven't uh, seen for a long time, namely a gross oversupply of well-trained scientists, Although he was a well-established and well-world-famous scientist, he was still looking for a permanent academic position. He joined the staff here then in 1937. He became involved in the Manhattan Project, which had no direct connection with Ames, because he had done some research during his period of activity on the rare earth elements. And a person that knew something about the rare earths, and nobody bothered much to uh, do much chemistry of the rare earths. He was one of a very small number of people that knew anything about it. Somebody with this background was needed on the project because some of the fission products of the fission of uranium were apparently uh, rare earth elements and also plutonium which was known in 1941, a new and unknown element. They knew nothing of the chemistry of it, and they expected it to be something similar to the rare earths in chemical and physical, metallurgical properties. So that's why Spedding became involved shortly after this involvement, which consisted primarily of his traveling into Chicago and supervising a group of people there. The need for a much larger supply of pure uranium metal became obvious. And uh, Spedding knew that there was some metallurgical equipment out here at Ames, which was available. So on the basis of that, a project to develop a faster process of making uranium, and casting it into desired shapes, needed shapes, 
was initiated and very quickly was successful and a simple cheap process was available in a matter of just months. Iowa State University had the necessary equipment and had the necessary people and so the project was here. The equipment that was here had been used incidentally rather extensively by Dr. Hayes who was the fellow that left here and thereby left an opening for spending to come. So you see, in the lives of individual people, there is an enormous role played by chance. I think that there's a much smaller role for chance in the collective history and the collective actions and, uh, and uh, uh, things that go on with human beings. Then how did I happen to join the project? Well, in the last days of the fall quarter in 42, I had a problem. Uh, I had two quarters to finish before getting my bachelor's in chemistry, but the money I'd saved during the summer working in a sawmill was just about gone. If I dropped out of school to get more money to go on, I would be promptly drafted, and if I didn't drop out of school and go to work, I would uh, starve to death because in those days there were very, very few student funds available for loans or uh, scholarships. Uh, before this problem had to really be resolved, I was invited into Dr. Spedding's office and offered a job on what he said was a very vital national defense project. And this seemed like the ideal way, <coughs> the ideal solution, uh, a chance to make some money so I could finish my degree without, before I would be drafted. So I said yes. What did I do? My role here was primarily as a foreman and an assistant foreman and a foreman on the uh, crew of people who were making uranium metal. And I worked on that for about two years. The uh, shortage of uranium was holding up very crucial experiments and uh, the fueling of some reactors so that we were under tremendous pr pressure to produce. We, this was during a period of war. It was 1942 and something which all too often we have forgotten, those of us that can remember back, is that in 1942, we didn't know who was going to win the war. In fact, it was still pretty iffy as to whether it was going to be the Third Reich or whether it would be the Allies. Allies. And so there was enormous pressure to get things going in a hurry, a sense of urgency based on the need to do this for national survival, and perhaps more than national survival, I think probably something close to survival of civilization as we know it today. Another thing that some of us have forgotten, and we need to be occasionally remembered, and reminded, is that in 1942 we were fighting against two of the most fanatical movements that the world has ever known who were able to mobilize people, nice people, as Dr. Carlson said, you come to love them as individuals, but collectively as a group, the Third Reich fought until there was no longer any hope of military success, stalemate or anything else, and kept on fighting almost until they were broken into a dozen pieces without any significant change in their dedication to fighting. The same thing was true of the Japanese war effort. It was even in the latter days, in the six-month period before the bomb was dropped, the Japanese dedication to fighting to almost the last man had not wavered at all, so that we were fighting against a very tough, movement and a 50-year period of ascendancy of the Third Reich would surely have changed civilization in Europe beyond almost anything else that we can comprehend. Uh, so we were being pushed. We felt an urgency. We worked 24 hours a day in three shifts, so we didn't all have worked that long, seven days a week and all holidays. Uh, in those days, there was a large shell loading plant down at Ankeny. There was also a rule 
that anyone who was uh, not quite fit for the Army and who wasn't uh, uh, involved in war work would be automatically drafted anyhow. This was to make sure that people would go to workplaces like Anthony. Uh, the project here in Ames never had that authority to grant a limited deferment for working there. And so we got only people who were obviously unfit for the Army, either by age or infirmity, and who also were not able to pass the qualifications for getting into Anthony. Uh, we had some people who were past 70, and uh, one of the jobs of the foreman very often turned out to be, although he was hired for his technical know-how, he was more often useful because he could do some of the heavy lifting that no one else around could. In a few months, we produced two million pounds of uranium, which had never been made on that scale before. The urgent need for the metal abated, and commercial plants took over, and then, attention turned to other metallurgical problems in the expected peaceful uses of atomic power. To wrap up, I'd like to make two observations. First of all, the Manhattan Project was a large effort. It was primarily a development effort. It was not primarily a research effort. The research knowledge was already in place and was a not all available, but enough so that what we needed to do was to take existing knowledge and existing technology and apply it to a very large scale process. <coughs> the action of any one individual scientist in either choosing to participate or not participate in this effort would have made no difference at all in the net effect. And given the collective decision by some large industrially uh, based group of people, the development of the atomic bomb was possible and could not have been stopped by any individual decisions. Uh, the other thing that, looking back, in those days, there were, although times were trying, by 45 and 46, there was a great deal more optimism about peace. We had great hopes for the United Nations. The Soviet Union was considered as a peace-loving nation by almost everyone in the United States. There was a profound distrust of U.S. generals and the military establishment in the United States. Uh, the thing that I see today is that there is a rather profound pessimism about peace. The United Nations is becoming nearly forgotten. U.S.-Soviet relationships are competitive and distrustful, and there still is a very profound distrust of U.S. generals and the United States military establishment. Thank you very much, Dave. Now it's your turn in the listening audience to join in. Is there someone who would like to either make a comment or put a question to one of our panelists? Yes. Joe, you mentioned something about that, that as a scientist here in, in Ames, that you were aware that the, the, uh, that the uranium metal was being used uh, in the reactor of Hanford. Were you also aware at that time of the, the um, work that was being done, for example, Los Alamos at Oak Ridge, uh, obviously at Chicago, you know about, but um, at Berkeley, et cetera. Were you aware of the total picture of what was going on towards the development of the bomb? Yes, I think we were all, uh, Dr. Spelling used to have his weekly get-togethers and, and, and we would, they would explain what was going on. We knew the alternate approaches, the, the ones going on at Oak Ridge. We were primarily here I think associated with the, the plutonium approach, and that's why we probably, or I felt I knew more about that. But certainly the the, uh, diffu the uh, gaseous diffusion approach of concentrating the isotopes, the uh, the calutron or the mass spectrograph approach. We were, yes, we were aware of all these approaches, and it turns out, incidentally, that all these approaches were successful to one degree or another. All, all four approaches that were 
tried to either concentrate an isotope or to develop plutonium um, were successful and um, could have been um, used to build a bomb. Um, in fact, the one that, uh, the first one on Hiroshima was the uranium bomb, which was uh, from the concentration of the gaseous fusion. We, yes, I think we were aware of quite a bit of the technology. I don't think that, I was not at least, the technology of the development of the bomb itself, how it was, how it was put together. I, that, one, that one caught me by surprise. I didn't know about it until the rest of the world did. Adolf, do you or they have anything to say in response? Uh, I think not. I think one point that Norm made I, that I'd like to uh, bolster is the fact that these various methods of, of getting the nuclear material for a bomb were, were all successful, and hence there's every, uh, there were, at that time there was ever more reason to believe that the uh, German scientists and German technologists were, were not very far behind us. The, finding out that they were that far behind was an extreme surprise. Another question. Jack, you had your hand up before. Well, I was wondering if, uh, if somebody were to have uh, bought or, or registered uh, some sort of discontent under these circumstances, this is a time of war, I, I can imagine that they would have been felt the threat of treason. It wouldn't have been considered uh, tantamount to treason under those circumstances? I don't think so, Jack. The, uh, uh, as uh, our speaker earlier mentioned, there was a, a large group at the University of Chicago who had signed petitions requesting that, the, that a, this, a, a demonstration bomb be used rather than a bomb on a, on a city. And there were similar groups in other parts of the, of the project at that time. I don't think anybody ever considered that they were, that they were treasonous because they uh, proposed such a, a different approach. I now, regret that I couldn't uh, be here for the, that speech, but was the, uh, was the position of Leo Salar known at the time? I mean, I understand that he petitioned uh, Harry Truman to go the demonstration route, and he was a key figure in, in engineering the, uh, the ideas for making the bomb. And I didn't know that his ideas became public knowledge. I don't know either uh, whether uh, his particular ideas were a part of that. He was no longer, at the latter part of the war, he was no longer a part of the strong effort being directed this way. Another question? Yes. First, I'd like to say that I appreciate the autobiographical slant because it emphasizes that we're dealing with real people in the system. So if I might begin with a autobiographical comment. With respect to every individual as to what direct actions and what direct acts they participate in. And here I think there are certain things which are uh, fairly easy to agree upon as being allowable and disallowable in terms of dealing with other human beings. When we start to go through a collective action of human beings, then we get into an entirely different set of values in which things become murky. And for example, warfare itself, if it is carried out between two individuals, is an unethical act on the part of both of them if they are both using deadly force. What we do not universally recognize this as being unethical in the case of armies in combat. And so that I think there are two ways in which we have to address this problem. And uh, the bigger problem is not the action and decisions of individual scientists. I think the biggest problem is that we as groups of individuals have not yet answered and met some of the very real problems, not in the field so much of science ethics as in the area of everyday uh, group interaction and ethics. That's a tough one. I, I don't know how we're, going to, how we're going to deal with that unless we deal with it. There is indeed a reason for great pessimism in our, in our, in the world ahead. Um, 
I think I'll quit there. I don't want to carry Norm, go ahead. Well, I'd just like to add a uh, kind of a footnote to your uh, reaction to Fermi and, and add that um, after the uh, war, when the American troops had come into uh, into Hagerloch, where this test reactor was, the uh, German scientists, uh, Ho Heisenberg and, uh, and Otto Hahn and others, were um, taken by the British and, and uh, housed in a farm home in, in England, where they were held, and their room was bugged. And at the time the bomb was dropped in, in, on August 6th, the reactions of those German scientists were recorded. And Otto Hahn's reaction, and I think it was an honest one, uh, was one of when he heard that 100,000 people had been killed, and his, his first reaction was, I am responsible. And, I, and he felt like committing suicide. And his next reaction was to turn to Werner Weisenberg and say, see, the Americans beat you, you're second class. <laughs> Adolf, let's take it down to a little more personal level. How do you see the problem of dealing with the ethical implications of your decision to go ahead and become a member of a, of a team of a project which from the standpoint of uh, nuclear chemistry you understood fairly well. I would say that given the circumstances of the war and uh, knowing what I did about the knowledge of uh, the process of fission in Germany, I did not consider that, that this was too unethical a thing for a previous pacifist to have done. I think it was obvious that at the time I made that decision, I decided that I could no longer claim that I was a pacifist. But uh, the, uh, the idea that, as has been alluded to before, that that such a device could get in the hands of Hitler was just uh, beyond imagination in terms of, of, what, of my own response. In general, I would say that I don't think that one can make any kind of rules for somebody else about the ethics of getting into a particular scientific uh, endeavor, which may have serious consequences. You can make the decision yourself, but you certainly can't. Uh, say that for somebody else that's the wrong thing to do. It has to be a personal thing. Yes. Well, let me bring this up to uh, up to date, <laughs> to right now. Uh, on a lot of campuses now, there are groups of students who argue with other students, have formal meetings, uh, urging graduates with PhDs and so on not to go to work for <coughs> the military-oriented companies like General Dynamics or Marquis. Forever. And let me ask the question to the three of you. Supposing a student came to you and said, look, I've got a pretty good offer from General Dynamics or whatever to work on a military project. Uh, should I take it or not? What would what you say? Let me repeat the question. The question is, if a young student, an aspiring young scientist came to any one or all three of you uh, to ask the following question. I've got an opportunity to go to work for a firm that's associated with producing weaponry or materials related to defense and offense in the area of military uh, armament, what would you respond to the student? Should they or should they not use their science in behalf of such project? Dave, we'll go with you first. You can rest. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I've thought about that for a long time because during a period from about 1936 to well past 1939, I was an ardent and adamant pacifist. I believed that all wars were fought for the evil gain of selfish empires such as the British and the French Empire. Uh, I looked upon the German correction of some of their historic national boundaries as being really something which was not too unreasonable and merely redressing some of the uh, um, inequities of the uh, Versailles Treaty. When you start out with that background and then go through the experience from 1939 to 1945, including the disclosure after the war, not during it, of 
the horrors of the Holocaust and seeing the persistence of the Third Reich and its, its military and political um, institutions, even when the Third Reich was cut into five or six pieces, you then see that the question is, is, uh, is not just a question of intent. And for example, if the United States had been better prepared, if we had bought more guns than butter in 1940, we perhaps could have uh, liberated part of uh, Poland before another million people died. Uh, those of us who politically uh, lent our uh, influence to postponing armament and postponing the liberation of, uh, of uh, some of the Dachau and those places, in a way contributed to that. And so that good intentions in this work imperfect world are not enough. We don't need any children's crusade. The military is no worse than the people that make the decision that sends it into action. And at least in our country, we elect in perhaps somewhat imperfect elections, but we elect in elections and those represent the will of the people. And the principles of democracy, I think, are something that are very dear to me. Norm, would you like to reply? Well, I, I guess my comment on, on your question, Dr. Long, is unfortunately that's where most of the jobs are today. And for students coming and saying, you know, I'm, I've got a job off General Dynamics on someplace else, and I say, well, now where else do you have a job off? So it's a, it's a tough question. Now, I think I would be very reluctant to encourage a student to take a job in an area where they might express to me some reservations about working. I think my advice would probably, would certainly be to them, wait, see if something better wouldn't turn up. Uh, but I don't think I can, in good conscience, also tell a student, well, that's a, that's a bad place to work. Don't go to work for General Dynamics. They make cruise missiles. Uh, I, I think that's a, too much of individual judgment. There are some people who think cruise missiles are or, you know, what's, what's good about our defense industry? And, uh, so I don't know. You've asked a very difficult question. Thanks, Norm. Adolf, would you like to reply? I guess I could just uh, echo what Norm has said. It depends so much upon the person himself. If the student has reservations about it, I would not belittle those reservations. If he really wants to discuss it and feels that, that this is a serious problem with him, I would certainly agree that he ought to wait around a little while and see whether, whether something comes up that would put him in, in a, uh, an industry that wasn't as highly involved in, in weapons. If I may, I'd like to embellish a little bit on Professor Long's question, bring it up to date in another way. As the three of you look back and you recall you probably all did notice these three gentlemen were rather young at the time, even younger than I am now. Uh, <laughs> it, 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 seem, it seems to me one area in which reflection has been going on and from which something good might come that's useful in our present circumstance uh, could be probed in the following way. If the three of you were asked to reflect upon your experience as research scientists, not only at that time, but coming forward from the point of 42 on, what kinds of recommendations might you make about the character of the educational system within which scientists are developed in our society? Would you advocate anything be modified concerning the general education that we develop for our students, especially with regard to the character of the scientists that we develop in that general context? Adolf, why don't you start? I guess I would think that uh, and I'm not sure how you do it, but I, I do feel that there is a, a lack of understanding of what, what is ethical and moral in today's students, that uh, one needs to do something to uh, increase the, the, the background and, and values of students in terms of, of their 
feeling and respect for their fellow man. And that, along with their scientific training, would, would help them, I would think. Norm, do you have something you'd like to say? I think I'll pass on that one for a moment. But <laughs> you have something you want to say, Dave? It's a uh, what? For a person who's, uh, who's been chairman of a curriculum committee, it's an embarrassing question to ask. <laughs> 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 Or uh, you know, when you when you design a, a curriculum in metallurgy, you uh, you run up against so many different uh, things you would like to accomplish, and within a very limited framework. Uh, that's not answering the question, I realize, but I. All right, another question. Yes. The uh, the Manhattan Project was given the go ahead in the late fall of 1941, at a time that this country was not at war. It was reasonable to believe at that time that Nazi Germany had a two-year lead in the development of nuclear weapons. You were in this project, some of you, uh, the project at least was ongoing, for more than three and a half years before it was known how the weapon was that you were in the process of helping develop was going to be used, if it was going to be used at all. To what extent did you think during that period that what you were really doing was developing a deterrent to the possible German use of nuclear weapons rather than a weapon that the United States would itself employ? The, the question is, in the period of time in which these gentlemen were involved in the project prior to the actual weapons <coughs> development, to what extent did they perceive their own involvement as associated with the project meant not for offensive use, but rather as a deterrent mechanism in anticipation of what Nazi Germany might otherwise do? Adolf? I think it's very difficult to uh, go back 40 years and uh, read recover from one's memory what one felt and thought at the time. We did feel some of the people in the project were much more concerned that the, that the Germans were close to a bomb than, than others. And I think that they in general felt that there would be some mechanism whereby it could be used as a, as a deterrent. I don't know that we, we felt that uh, this was necessarily so, but I just don't remember addressing the problem. Dave? As I think back the course of the uh, military and other actions during World War II, I see very little evidence that deterrence ever worked during World War II. And I just doubt to the depth of my soul that Adolf Hitler would have ever been stopped for five seconds by conditions or thoughts of deterrence, no matter what we had. Norm, do you have something to add? Uh, when Sorry. the Germans first began to use the buzz bombs against uh, uh, England, there was an immediate concern that this rather futile weapon was really uh, being just tried out as a carrier for their uh, you know, atomic bombs. And when the V2s started to fall, well, then everyone was certain that there really was no sense in burning all that fuel just to carry a few hundred pounds of TNT. You're going to carry something big. No? <clears throat> well, I think, uh, at least in my mind, the initial motivation for me, and I, I understood it that way, was um, I'm not sure whether deterrent was quite the, quite the right word, but at least as a, as a defensive weapon. In other words, if the Germans have one, we must have one, so that at least we don't succumb to blackmail or worse. I think Peter uh, Leiden made an important uh, point in his book, however, and I, I guess I'm, I have to go through this transition myself, and that was that after, the Germans had surrendered. And we no longer had the concern about the, the Germans having a bomb. This did not 
stop the progression toward developing the bomb. In fact, the testing, the Trinity test in New Mexico was in June or July after, after the surrender of the Germans. So that we got into this, I think the point that you used, we got, we got caught up into this thing and we were carried along without really, and I don't even remember asking the question. We, we've gone, gone from a de defensive to an offensive weapon. Um, and yet that's what we did. Thank you. Next question? Yes. Uh, I've read or heard it said that, that, that Einstein said that with the creation of the atom bomb, everything was changed except our mode of thinking. I've got two questions. Did he say that? <laughs> and the other thing is, if he said it, is it true? And if it is true, what are the implications of that? The question is, did Einstein really say with the creation of the bomb that everything has changed but our mode of thinking. The next question is, is that true? And what are the consequences of dealing with that fact? Who would like to handle it? Uh, Adolf, would you like to start? I'm, af I'm afraid I can't uh, address that question. I don't know that whether Einstein said it. I've never seen it previously, but that doesn't prove a thing. And uh, I'll pass. Dave or Norm? Well, I've, I've seen the remark, the, the, the statement credited to Einstein. I have no great difficulty in believing it, but I can't verify it. But uh, unfortunately, I think it's an astute observation whether he said it or not. Dave, would you like to respond? I think uh, that precisely the same problems of not being able to resolve conflicts between groups of people, which was responsible for World War II, which was responsible for, world, for wars before that, all through the history of mankind, is still something we haven't coped with today. Uh, something that bothers me a great deal is how does a democracy deal with a fanatical group of people who are dedicated to uh, uh, some other course of action other than following the, the will of the majority to a point of, uh, where they will do any kind of terrorist act uh, to, uh, to sell their point of view. That, uh, how can we deal with this? This is something that uh, hasn't been uh, ever solved or ever uh, dealt with. So I think many of the same problems that we had 50 years ago, 40 years ago are still here today and I don't know, I know a lot more problems than I know answers in that area. Next question. Yes. Yeah, in response to the last comment, I'd like to ask why is it that universities or our own Department of Defense doesn't fund research into uh, conflict resolution, civilian based <coughs> alternatives to war? How do we communicate? If you don't mind, I'll put your question even more generally. Why is it the case that society generally doesn't support the funding of research having to do with understanding the nature of conflict and its resolution? Do, does any one of you or do all three of you have the answer for that? I don't have an answer. Do you think that the scientific community itself, given its, its important proximity to the kinds of problems that can come out of research for us, that is the development of weapons that we seem to have difficulty controlling on a rational basis. Do you think the scientific community itself has any special responsibility to advocate that organizations such as NSF or NIH or the National uh, uh, Energy Group, what have you, call or set aside monies for this type of research? Yes. Well, in that context, who do you suppose is qualified to do that kind of research? So often, taking myself as a civil engineer, I can have opinions on what we ought to do about those things, but I'm not professionally competent to rule on some of these matters except as a matter of conscience. You don't do research as a matter of conscience. But I gather the answer to the general question is that there doesn't seem to be anybody who would be qualified to do the research. I can't think of anybody who would be qualified to do that kind of research. Well, your, the observation that there doesn't seem to be anybody qualified to do that kind of research is directly related to my earlier question. As we reflect upon the past 40 to 50 years, what's been going on in our society in general, and more specifically, 
what's been going on that can be directly related to scientific achievement. Have you learned anything about the general character of education, which, if taken into account, might then put us in a position to have available people capable of doing the kind of research we're now talking about? Well, I think that mixing what is done in research with what is done in, in perhaps a religious uh, meditation. That's an interesting two cultures observation, isn't it? <laughs> Very interesting. C.P. Snow would be right at home. That's exactly what lies behind, again, the earlier question that I put in following up through Dr. Long. If we continue to live in that two-culture world, then it appears to be the case that we are forever destined to have to say nobody is truly competent to deal with those basic underlying moral issues upon which we base the general decisions that we make in the shaping of our community. That essentially remains once and for all a subjective matter not to be relied upon as a base for public policy. Isn't that a consequence of the position you're now taking? I think it is. Mm -hmm. Basically, that there are some things that one does research on, and there are other things that you raise value judgments about. Mm -hmm. Whether you can do research on value judgments is a matter that, that uh, I find is mind boggling. Yeah, this is full circle. Chaplain Hansen's in the audience. About 20 years ago, there was a, a program of this type on campus, and this was the central issue. How do we bring together our concern to make use of science for certain practical gains with our desire to make those decisions within the context of a general set of values that are generally shared by the community? Anybody out there like to make a comment about that general problem? Don't let me do all the talking. You're here on the panel. Adolf? You're doing it. <laughs> <laughs> yes, in the back. There are at least uh, maybe two or three questions that should be put here in sequence. Uh, one, um, do you generally agree that over the past 40 to 50 years, uh, a good deal of the direction given to scientific research has come from an area of concern, namely defense and offensive uh, uh, development? Uh, two, as a result of that emphasis, have we in fact deprived ourselves of significant non-military gains that might otherwise have been made by using those same scientists. And three, if that's the case, what would you gentlemen, as senior citizens of the science community and senior citizens generally, have to say by way of Solomonic observation that we might build on from here forward? Let's start with the youngest member of the panel, <laughs> Dave Peterson. Maybe we can throw a little light on that if uh, we go back and look a little bit at the allocation process, which occurs, after all, within the Congress of the United States. And someone who was, uh, I don't remember exactly who it was, but someone who was responsible for trying to get more money for research said that you can go into these congressional committees and beg and plead for more money for pure research and more money for uh, basic research and more money for interesting research and you won't come out with a dime. If you go in and plead for money for a national emergency to stave off a uh, fresh water shortage, uh, you're probably too young to remember that, but about 15 or 18 years ago we had a, a tremendous shortage where the federal government had to pour out hundreds of millions of dollars to solve the problem of drinking water. Uh, if you do that, you get money. If you go in and say, the Russians have one, you get money. And 
so that it gets down to a question of what things motivate Congress, and Congress is us. We have elected the people in Congress. They respond to our inputs, and uh, that's where we're going to have to uh, start selling the job of uh, reallocating resources if that's the thing that should be done. Norm, would you like to reply? Well, I certainly agree that the matter of peace is too important to not to put as much emphasis on, at least as we do when preparing for war. And yet we don't do that. And I, I'm not sure this is the job for the scientists. I believe there might be other professions who are better prepared to deal with that kind of an issue, uh, although certainly uh, technical, um, there could be some te technical uh, breakthroughs that might contribute to peace. This is one of the arguments, of course, President Reagan uses for the Star Wars thing, um, which I find a little hard to follow, but nonetheless, it's, it's the argument. But uh, I, um, I think we, I think we need uh, emphasis. But I, I, as Dr. Peterson has said, the uh, the allocations are decided really by uh, where the issues are. In my judgment today, the problem that concerns me almost as much as as nuclear uh, armaments is. Uh, is the, is the pollution problem. As I travel around in this world and see what's happening, and, and we can't even, you know, can't even agree whether there's any, what the problem is and, 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 and what we should do about it. And yet you see the, the, the trees in, in, in Europe and, and uh, the United States and Canada uh, going. And I think this is a, a problem of great seriousness, which Many people would be very happy to work on, I think, if there were a little bit more uh, recognition of the seriousness of that type of problem. So I don't think this is the only serious problem that faces us. Uh, that's what I'm, I'm saying. Mm -hmm. Adolf, would you like to add something? Uh, well, not very much. The, I think it's interesting <coughs> in terms of what's happened here. We talked about the history of the Ames Laboratory and its original uh, founding formation of the Manhattan, local Manhattan project as a part of the war effort. But the laboratory has continued here without getting involved in any the thing that approaches uh, war work. We no longer have had, we haven't had anything, any secret or classified work being done in the laboratory for many years. In other words, it is possible to get government uh, funding for a laboratory that, uh, while it does engineering that may have some military application, is certainly not a direct uh, kind of military work that would require a classification of secrecy. Thank you very much. Yes? In the back. I, you're getting very uncomfortable. I spent my career quite a while ago uh, as a social scientist, and I was concerned with trying to, to find objective information to work on human problems, and I think I did. They weren't the kind of problems you talk about here, but I'm really cast with confidence that, that scientific methodology can work on human conflict resolution. And I think you people have been very pessimistic, and I kind of expect that of physical science. <laughs> <laughs> Just these guys. <laughs> Would anyone else like to make a comment <laughs> or add another question? Both in like an economist. Yes, again. In, in 1980, when Reagan was elected, I was a graduate student at Berkeley, and a number of my professors at that time, uh, I was also connected with the Lawrence Berkeley Laboratory, associated with the Ames lab here. And a number of my professors were quite concerned about that time. And many of them were discussing the possibility that they would have to redirect their research programs to more of a Department of Defense slant. 
because of Reagan and his policies. Uh, I, what I'd like to do is, is perhaps pose a, a bit of a rhetorical question, I guess, or a, a thought. The three of you have stated that you willingly uh, used your scientific background in the war effort in the 1940s. If the thing with Reagan proliferates to a point where Ames Laboratory is asked to uh, contribute in a, in a similar way, would you be so willing? I will put the question again if you don't mind. It's really not a rhetorical question. Um, all three of you, it's been observed, were willingly involved in the Manhattan Project, which was part of the larger project associated with developing the first atomic bomb, in particular historical circumstances. Reflecting on the present political situation of our country and the apparent plans and ideas of our president, were those plans and ideas in the area of military development, defense and offensive systems to lead eventually to the point of wanting to get the Ames Lab involved in that general program of military development, what position would, would you take with regard to the question, should the Ames Lab become involved or not? Ado? I just don't think the two situations are comparable. We were in a war situation at that time, and uh, a, a situation at the present time in which there, uh, there was a request that we get involved in Star Wars. I can speak uh, plainly. I'm no longer uh, employed by the university or the laboratory. I, I would think that, uh, that personally, I would have a, a great deal of reluctance to get involved in something unless uh, granted that there is no emergency about it. And it would take an awful lot to convince me that Star Wars constitutes an emergency. No? I, I would share the same view. I think I would be more skeptical about um, plunging into something uh, of that nature than I was when I was younger and more idealistic, maybe, or more something. I'd like to also uh, just make a comment to my good friend Wallace Hobbs' comment about the pessimism. I, I'm not sure pessimism is quite the word that I would want to convey. I'm, I'm more, uh, at, I, I think his point is, is the point I was trying to make too, that there's, I think, much of the scientific methodology that could be used to uh, uh, foster peace. But I think that it, it requires people with perhaps a different perspective and orientation to um, bring scientific scientists in to help with uh, the application of that methodology. I, I don't think we're really trained to be political scientists or whatever is in, involved, whatever would be involved in, in, in leading such a movement. Um, Dave? With regard to the first question, which is, would I participate? The answer to that, there might be personal, if I had decided to retire, then I probably wouldn't. Bar, <coughs> barring that, we live in a democracy. I did not vote for Reagan, but Reagan is my president. A lot of my friends and a lot of my relatives and a lot of my acquaintances voted for him. A majority of the American people voted for him. A majority of the American people voted for the Congress that has appropriated money for the present uh, programs. I may not agree with all of them, but I do believe in democracy. It may not be perfect, but it beats whatever's in second place. And I, therefore, would feel an obligation as a member of the uh, democracy to participate in, if I were called, in the uh, actions of the United States government. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Another question. Yes. I've got a little different kind of a question. Uh, I've, uh, I, I, didn't, I didn't live in the 1940s, I barely remember the 1950s, but in my lifetime I've observed a, a general defense of a complex which, in my opinion, has kind of been obsessed with secrecy and the secrecy of everything they do. And I've always suspected that this, this was born out of the 1940s, particularly out of the Manhattan Project. And I 
guess my question is a personal one. To what extent were you told not to go home and talk with your wives about the project? To what extent were you being checked up on by the FBI? And, and do you agree that this kind of, what I think is an obsession with secrecy was born out of World War II? No, two questions being put to the really panel. Yes. The first question is, to what extent were you governed by a, a strict secrecy code at the time? And uh, second question, do you think that the character of that code at the time is causally related to the contemporary secretiveness about what goes on in defense? Perhaps it might have been born then. Let's see. I would, yeah, I would like to take my son's question first. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I think he's a liar, and I think we're getting grilled right now. Oh, right. <laughs> <laughs> this is a setup. We are the jury. <laughs> Uh, yes, the, the, there was a tremendous secrecy in, in this work during the war. And in the first um, 10, or 12, 10 or 15 years that you were growing up, much, there was much secrecy. Much uh, I could have talked about, and I did talk about, you didn't listen. <laughs> 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 Go ahead, David. I don't think that secrecy in uh, warfare and military uh, uh, preparations and uh, actions dates from World War II. I think if we look at history, it goes all the way back to the first improved club. Somebody wanted to take a look at it and uh, steal the secret. Uh, if we look at Sir Isaac Newton, uh, he uh, served for a long time on a committee which was to look for a better way of uh, navigating their ocean vessels. And do you think if the British had found that during his time that they would have uh, broadcast that to the French and the Portuguese and the Spanish? No. Uh, the other interesting thing about secrecy during World War II is that it started long before the U.S. Army was responsible for the Manhattan Project. It started in 1940 at the instigation of the scientists, and most of those scientists were refugees from uh, the uh, Nazi uh, menace in uh, Europe, and the reason that they saw the need for security and, and uh, sec secrecy was because they didn't want to give the Germans an unfair advantage in the, in the uh, uh, competition. Thanks, Dave. Uh, Adolf? Well, I would say, which has uh, just echoed what's been said before, with regard to the secrecy during the, during the war, it was essentially complete. I do know of some cases in which wives knew a little bit more about what was going on than, than others, and uh, questions were raised, and the, the, uh, some, of the, some of, the, of the women wondered what, what they were talking about. But, but there was such secrecy that we couldn't explain it. And, uh, the, but I don't really, I sort of think, agree with Dave, this matter of military secrecy has gone long before the Manhattan Project. Before we, uh, Chaplin, yes, excuse me. I would make one comment about this um, uh, question of participation in war uh, research vis-a-vis -vis the origins of the Manhattan Project in the uh, The thing that I think a lot of people who are not uh, uh, over 40, look at me like quite a few people are not who are here, uh, and might not recognize that they, during the Second World War, the campuses were at war. It's not at all like the Vietnam War or the Korean War or something of this sort. So if you went on any campus, any campus in the United, United States, uh, you would find full of B-12 students, ASD students, and so on. And it was also so that it was full of defense research. So it was so that, for example, here they were working in the Manhattan Project. In Chicago, they were working in the Manhattan Project. At MIT, they were working on the radar project. At Michigan, they were working with the BP project. Either you were, if you were on the campus, you were either working on that, or you were a soldier in the army, or you were a draft. And, and uh, so the, the um, colleges and universities were part of the war that very conspicuously announced. That wasn't so in Korea, it wasn't so in, in uh, Vietnam, it's not so now. If you are uh, under those circumstances, very natural to be doing that kind of work in the university, 
now it's a disadvantage to employ them in the university. So therefore, the federal government does not fund this kind of work in the university. We get no money at the AIDS laboratory from the uh, 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 military affairs division of, the, of DOE because they put that in weapons laboratories where they are specialized. That's a very important uh, comment. Historically, at the time of the Manhattan Project, the military system was essentially integrated into the university system in the United States, vice versa. Before we wrap up today's program, I would like to point out a couple of things to you about what's going to happen later on. This evening at 8 p.m. in Curtis Auditorium, Dr. Professor Franklin Long from Cornell University at Ithaca will be giving a lecture. Professor uh, Long is the Emeritus Professor of Chemistry Society and Science and Society at Cornell University. Uh, it's going to be a fine lecture, and I suggest you show up no matter what. There will be more programs tomorrow as well. There are bulletins posted all over explaining them. Let me make one last comment so that we end with some closure. Remember, we're interested in what can be learned from reflection on the past, specific reflections such as that, uh, that we've done today on our Manhattan Project at Iowa State. With regard to learning from the past and applying those lessons to the future, it seems to me two things have emerged here today. One, the people at Iowa State, and this is undoubtedly true elsewhere, who were involved basically are people. They're human beings like the rest of us. Two, it may be the case that the real problem for us is not that we have something called nuclear weapons. It may be the case that the real problem for us is that as a result of the advances of science over the last 50 years, our capacity for being able to do all kinds of things has grown so far ahead of our basic capacity to act as intelligent, sensible, moral agents that we have more to fear in our moral insensitivities and incapacities than we do in our scientific capacities. And perhaps that's the lesson for us to learn as we continue on through this program series at Iowa State. Thank you all for coming. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dave. Good to get together with you guys again. Yeah, it was great. It was great. Dave. It's always nice to be around.